I want you to join me, if you will, in the book of Matthew. And uh, we're going to kind of review the last, the closing verses of chapter 16. And then we're going to run on into chapter 17 this morning. And a message I've entitled, On the Mountaintop with Jesus. On the Mountaintop with Jesus. Last week, we... uh, we looked at the beginning in verse 21 of chapter 16, uh, the transition statement from that time on. And in Matthew 4, uh, Jesus, the same, with, with the same transition statement from that time on, Jesus began his public ministry of, of teaching and preaching and miracles. And now in chapter 16, verse 21, there is another transition since from this time on, Jesus began to uh, reveal his plan to his disciples, and, and it was a transition from the public ministry to a more private teaching and preparing and instructing his close followers for his death and for his resurrection, and then ultimately for his ascension back to the Father as they would then, uh, as the, 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 taking the good news of the gospel and the, the birth of the church, he would leave that in, in their hands, preparing them for that. So it's this, it's this transition uh, that happened. And the way Jesus began that, it says that he began to tell them or to show them God's plan. He began to show him how he must go to Jerusalem and how he must suffer, how he must uh, endure of suffering and persecution, and then how, he, how come he must die. And then his resurrection. We looked at that. And we looked at three reasons last week. Uh, quickly, for those of you that were just joining us. And it's good to have the prices back home for the summer from, I want to say Cambodia, but it's not. Is it Thailand? Cambodia. Is it right? That's amazing that I got it right the first time. But Scott, it's good to have you all back home. So as, as we look at this, his reasons, and the reasons were because of sin. Uh, and Scripture says that all of us have sin and come short of the glory of God. And there had, to be a, there had to be a reckoning for the sins because sin demanded judgment. And part of that was, was the blood sacrifice or death. Hebrews 9.22 says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remissions of sin. And so from Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned and disobeyed God and hid themselves, and when God came looking for them in the Garden of Eden... And uh, they, they, they said, we, we're, we're hid from it because we were naked. And he realized they had sinned. And so God there uh, kills an animal and, and comes and brings the skins to clothe Adam and Eve. And it's, it's the first time then of, of death and the shedding of blood in God's creation. And we realize that that is a picture of that which would be to come with the Lamb of God shedding his blood. For the remission of our sins. So Jesus had to come for that. And then Jesus came also uh, and he would suffer and he would die and he would be raised back to life to complete and to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies that, uh, that the prophets had told the Messiah would do when he comes. So as, as we, all these things are pointing to that. At the end of that, uh, as he tells them this, Peter then Again, thinking as he had been taught and not understanding God's plan, but thinking of the way man thought that when the Messiah came, he would come as a conquering king. Man, he would come and he would kick the Romans back to Rome. He would reestablish Israel and Jerusalem there as the as the center of the world power. And this was in their mind. This was what they were envisioning. And they never had a concept of of the, the Messiah coming as a suffering servant. As a substitute for our sin. But that was exactly God's plan. And Jesus began to tell him that. Peter, Peter thinking like a man, said, Jesus, that, that's not going to happen to you, man. We're not going to let them do We're not let them treat you that way. Surely you'd never have to die. You're the Messiah. You're the one. And that doesn't include dying. And Jesus rebukes Peter uh, there in verse 23 of chapter 16. And then we talked about Jesus' invitation of, of becoming a follower of his uh, is to deny ourselves, to lay down our life, take up our, our cross and follow him. And this, this, this kind of paradox of thing, that Jesus says, if you want to really know what life is, you've got to give your life up for me. 
If you try to, to grab life by, by, by your means and by your hands, if you try to grab all the gusto you can in life, you're going to lose it. Because Satan's going to paint a picture of, of a mirage, a picture of deception. And when you get there, it's not what it was promised to be. Only in him. And then we didn't, I didn't finish right at the end of, ver, of chapter 16. Jesus then would say, verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here, in verse 28 of chapter 16, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And it's a natural transition because when the next, when we pick up here in, in chapter 17 now, it's been a week, six to eight days, uh, somewhere in there, and depends on, on um, how you look at it, but it's been a, a week, six days. Jesus takes Peter and James and John, the two brothers, with him, and he brings them up to a high mountain apart. And verse 2 says, and while they were there, Jesus was transfigured before them. And, and that, that word is, is almost the same word as, as uh, is it metamorphosis? Is it, it was a transition from a cocoon to a butterfly. Uh, there he's, he's changed. His face shines like the sun. His, his clothing is as white as, as the light. And with him there on the mountain are Moses and Elijah talking with him. Talking with him. Now, there's a, there's a couple of, of times in Scripture that I would just, I, I'm, I'm, I know when I get to heaven, I probably, I'll know as he knows, but I would love to just sit down with the two disciples that Jesus, that walked with Jesus there in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. Remember that? Remember they had been there and the, the crucifixion and all the things that happened and they were on their way back to Emmaus. With trying to sort out what they heard that they were that he was not dead, but he was alive, but they knew he had been dead, and and they meet Jesus, don't know it's him, and he walks along with them these few miles to Emmaus, and Scripture says that he beginning with with Moses, it began to explain to them and share with them who he was, what scriptures had said about him. I would love to have sat in that Bible study, just or just got notes. Uh, from that Bible study of, of Jesus explaining. The second thing that I've always thought about and, and loved is what Moses and Elijah were saying to him. They were, they were conversing. Now, we get insight on this from Luke chapter 9, verse 30 and 31, I think it is, that Craig's got in Luke 9. Tells us, And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, and they spoke of his death, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. And I, and I look at this, and I think, you, man, this is so, this is so neat. This is so important. I've kept, kept been praying for days. I said, Lord, show me the significance of this story that's recorded in, in so many of the Gospels. Show me the significance of this transfiguration it's more than just know that you spoke with Moses and Elijah there and they spoke with you but but what's this all about and I think it's very very significant the writer in Romans chapter 3 uh, would would explain the significance of Moses representing the law and uh, you know the basic little first five books there of, of Old Testament and then Elijah representing the, the prophets there. Look at what Romans 3, 20 and 21 says. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. For by the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God and how, and how does the righteousness of God, how is that imparted to those who put their faith and trust in him? Through his son, Jesus Christ, by faith of Christ. It's his righteousness. It's by our faith in his imputed, Romans says, or it's accounted, put to our, our credit, that by faith that we trust in him. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe. 
For there's no difference. And here he's saying there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It's those who believe. And so we see the significance here that Christ, as he's trying to, uh, again, prepare his followers for, his, for, for this culmination of this mission that he's been on here on earth, this rescue mission for humankind, I like to call it. And as he's preparing them that, yes, that's going to include a lot of suffering on his part. It's going to include his death, which I know you hadn't been thinking about, guys. But it's going to also include a glorious resurrection. And in that is the culmination of all the law and all the prophets. Because the law was to point us to our inability to live sinless, but would be point, pointing us to the one who would come and live sinless, Jesus Christ, who, di who, who did that, came and did not sin so that he could die as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And it would be to point us to him and then the, 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 the fulfillment of all the prophecies. So Jesus is saying it's that culmination of everything. It's that culmination of all the law and all the prophets. And you need to understand what's going on here. And it was so cool, I think, that he would do that with his disciples. So what did, um, what did Moses bring to that conversation? I've thought about that. You know, I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, um, Moses, my goodness, what would he bring to that? And there's a couple of things that just come to my mind. And there's one that I'll just tell you I had not seen before. I knew Hebrews 11, uh, this great roll call of faith of heroes of men and women of faith and I knew Moses was in there and I, and I knew a lot about Moses' life but there's something here I'd never seen before look at this with me it says by faith Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents remember the edict by the Pharaoh that the, the, the Jewish slaves were getting so, so the, the population was exploding that he became afraid that they would uh, they would be more than the Egyptians. So he was, he was telling them they had to kill all the male children. Well, they hid Moses for three months. And then they, remember, they put him on the, uh, in, on the Nile. And he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Because, and they, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, remember, Pharaoh's daughter then raised him. But you remember that as he got older, he saw the two, uh, two Hebrews uh, striving with each other. Or a Hebrew and a, an Egyptian. And he killed the Egyptian. Uh, and, and it says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now look at this next verse. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God. Now under, I've heard that. Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for seasons. Stay right here. Great message. You've heard it preached. You know, real honest. Sin has an allurement. You, you don't, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're fishing for... For fish, and we got some good fishermen in here. Chance, a pike fisherman, uh, Jim, he can catch everything. But if you're if you're, if you're fishing for fish, you want your lure to be attractive. You don't throw something in there that looks, you know, like like a rock, you know. But you throw something in that that looks attractive. It looks alive. That they're gonna they're gonna go wild over. Okay, there is a there is an allurement. It is a deception. But there is an allurement in sin. And anyone that tells you that is probably not telling you the complete truth. But there's always a hook in sin. It's just like the, it's just like the lure. There's always that, that when you inhale or when you bite and when you strike. And, and remember, I remember Charlie Orr saying that sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. It'll cost you more than you wanted to pay. Some of us know that, right? Some of us know that. The danger comes, listen to me now. I don't care whether you're young or whether you're old. The danger comes when you said, nah, I can handle that. I won't let the hook catch me. Even Moses, this story, yeah, yeah, we could talk about. It. Rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin, and he had all that Egypt had to offer. All he had to do was identify with, the, the, with Pharaoh's daughter, the one that raised him. He had the best of the land of one of the best dynasties in the world at that time. They were all there before him. But Moses, here it says, chose rather to suffer the afflictions with God's people. Look at the next verse. This is what I had never seen before. Moses, 
esteeming the reproach of Christ. I haven't even thought about that. I, I'm thinking, yeah, he wanted to be identified with, with God's people, the Hebrews. But the writer now here says that Moses was esteeming the reproaches of Christ. How did Moses know about Christ? Through the prophets, he knew the teachings, evidently that even his mom at an early age had taught him about the one who was going to come. We sang, I love this. What, a, what an appropriate thing, Mildred. Over the years, um, and, and we've been ministering together for four or five at least, and I, and I, and I, tell, I, I tell her this. Um, I, I've never been uh, organized enough to say, okay, Mildred, this, I may have done it once or twice. This is what I'm preaching on Sunday. If you got any songs, it's going to go with this. But she always prays. This is how she gets the songs that she's supposed to sing on a given Sunday. And so when you were singing, these are the days of Elijah. And I thought about that this morning. I almost got plum happy over there. Because it talks about, it's, it's talking about the year of Jubilee. And it says, lift up your voices and shout because it's the year of Jubilee. If we understood what that meant, the freedom, the year of Jubilee was a year when everything was set free. It went back to the risen. It was put right. All the debts, all the debts that were not paid, they were paid in full in the year of Jubilee. Jesus Christ came to fulfill all that and in him we experience freedom and we don't have to wait once every 50 years because he has come to bring that freedom for all who believe and trust in him so Moses choosing now to suffer he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt wow this is Moses that's talking with him there on the mountain and not only that not only had, was Moses speaking from, from that experience, but he's also speaking from what he understood that God had showed him. Remember Exodus chapter 12? Moses leaves, he goes to the wilderness up there in Midian, and there uh, God gives him a wife, and he has a couple of boys, and then God sends him back down into Egypt to lead the Hebrews who are still enslaved to freedom. And there God speaks through Moses and, and Aaron and nine of the plagues that deal with, each deals with a different God of the Egyptians. The tenth plague, God says to, to Moses, you need to tell the people that this is it. That I'm coming, that I'm sending the death angel. He is going to visit every home. And the firstborn of every home is going to die. And the only way the only way to escape that is the, is the family has to take a, uh, a lamb. And if they were poor and couldn't afford it, they would get two families together. They'd take a lamb. They had to be a perfect lamb. They the, had to be very specific. Couldn't be, couldn't be one of the you know, broke leg or one that you're just going to call and kill anyway. Had to be perfect. Had to put it up. Had to keep it up a certain number, length of time. And then they had to kill it, a, a particularly had to slaughter it. They had to take the blood, put on the side of the doors, put over the lintel, and then the, 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 the lamb itself had to be prepared a specific way, and then that dealt with a specific way. And Moses would write this in Exodus chapter 12, saying to the people, God speaking says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I'm going to execute judgment, says the Lord. And the blood shall be to you a token upon the house. What does a token mean? What is a token? What does that mean? It's a sign. It's something that represents some effort. You ever, you ever go to play these games and you get tokens? <clears throat> They're not real money, but they stand for real money. You probably paid real money to get those tokens, or you earned them. And usually you pay a lot of money on a, on a, on a token. You know, you pay $5 to get a prize that costs 25 cents. But you won, okay? What was this blood a token of, a sign of, a representation of? Exactly, Anise. Exactly. This blood is a, is a representation of the sinless blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, 
which was slain before the foundation of the world. God knew before Exodus and this Passover lamb, God's plan was all along that his son, his son would come and live sinless to pay for my sins and your sins. And so they told the people in Egypt, when I see the blood, which is a token upon the houses, and when I see it, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you while I smite the land of Egypt. Now, I want to tell you, that was simply a, a, a token or a representation of what was to come as Jesus Christ would said, shed his blood. But let, listen to me and listen carefully. The truth of that representation fulfilled in Jesus Christ, unless the blood of Jesus Christ has, unless you have received his forgiveness, and that blood has been applied to your heart and your life. Then you are living under the condemnation of death. And if you go into eternity that way, you will be eternally separated from Christ and from all that he's prepared for those who love him. In a place that God prepared for Satan and his, his, his demons. We call it hell. The blood of Jesus Christ has to be applied to our lives. We do that by faith when we receive him as our Savior. Then we do that and he comes into our hearts and lives of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So Moses understood. He understood that God's plan for Christ's redemption included Jesus Christ dying and shedding his blood to cover our sins. And so Moses is talking with, with Jesus there, and I, I, I see him encouraging. You can do it, man. Listen. You, you can do it. Whatever it is, God, listen, God is faithful. This is why you came. They were talking with him. And, and then I wonder what Elijah, what Elijah brought to the conversation. I mean, it's just me. They're on the mountaintop with Jesus. Jesus has picked chosen Peter, James, and John. He's tucked you all up there. He's been trying to, he's, he's trying to prepare you and get ready for, to understand his plan of redemption for mankind. You've seen the miracles. You've believed in who he was, but you didn't understand that that also included suffering and dying and being raised again from the dead. And then this period in between there when the Gentiles and all, all the people of the world, that whosoever will, whosoever would believe in him, and receive his forgiveness and let his blood come in and cover our lives that we too would experience that freedom, that jubilee of being free in him. I wonder what Elijah brought to that conversation. Well, I, uh, I, I kind of think all the combination, but, but it's, I sum it up in one passage uh, is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, uh, and by the way, Elijah... Uh, he, was the, he was the guy, right? Sunday school classes, a lot, of, a lot of them, the younger ones are in children's church, but Sunday school classes, even adults, you just got to say about Elijah and Elisha, right? And Elijah was this, was this crazy prophet. I mean, he was just crazy, trusted God crazily. He just believed God. God did some, I mean, awesome things. And he was, he was a guy that, that didn't die, right? He, 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 he was caught up in a chariot of fire. Uh, taken to heaven. Who was the other guy in the Old Testament that didn't die? Enoch. Enoch. Scripture says Enoch walked with God. And one day he was not because God took him. Old preacher said Enoch walked with God. And one day they was out walking. And God said, Enoch, we're just closer to my home than yours. Come home with me. Yeah. <laughs> so you got this. So, so here is Elijah. And Elijah of all the prop combination. And in, in Isaiah 53, just read this with me. And. And look and listen to what God is saying hundreds of years before this mountaintop that we're on in chapter 17. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. It's, it's talking about, he's talking about the Messiah, Christ. He has no form nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. It's talking about all the, the suffering and the persecution, his beard being plucked out, his face being beaten, uh, the, the crowns of thorns poked on his head, and blood ran down. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, back up there, the iniquity of us all. Okay, that's all right. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. But he didn't open his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep before his shearers dumb. He didn't say a word. He was taken from prison judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. The transgression, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall... Divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Man, did you, did you notice how many times through there? He keeps saying, Jesus is, going to be, Jesus is going to endure this. Jesus is going to be persecuted. Jesus is going to, be, to suffer. Jesus is going to be mistreated. Jesus is going to be doing all this. And he's doing it so that he on him will be placed my sins and your sins. He had to do it to bear our sins. And, I, and, and as, as, as Moses and Elijah begin to talk with Jesus, man, I think, oh my goodness. How much, we talk about how much the father loved the son. Here his son is, everything he's done, he's done to please his father. And he's done a good job of it. And now the son is heading toward, the, 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 headed toward carrying the sin load of the world. And the father, even though he sent angels to minister in the garden, here the father is, I believe, is, is encouraging Jesus now with Moses and Elijah. And not only that, it's what is happening with Peter and James and John. Let's look at this. While they were... Um, it says, and, and uh, verse 4 says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, I wonder what Jesus had said. I looked in, other, in the other gospels, and all the other gospels where this is recorded say the same thing. Then Peter, then answering Peter said to Jesus. Maybe it's just in response to what he had been hearing. I don't know. But then Peter, I identify with him. He a lot of times spoke. He engaged his mouth before he engaged his mind, okay, his brain. You know, if it, if it come across his mind, it was out. Whew. Peter said, Lord, it's good that we're here with you. We'll just build booths for you and for Moses and for Elijah. We'll just stay right here. Now, if, you, if you've ever been in one of those services where the Holy Spirit of God just showed up in a real way, you don't understand what they mean by that. You know, it doesn't matter if it's second service or what time of day it is. When the Holy Spirit of God descends and so so I, I tell people sometimes it's so sick and so thick and sometimes it's like just waves of the ocean time loses importance everything else loses significance you're in his presence he is doing awesome things and and we're you know and we're the, it's 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 hard to explain it's like it's like telling you how good it's, it's, it's this is a bad illustration but it's like trying to tell you how good chick-fil-a's peach milkshakes are Barbie and I had our first one yesterday. By the way, you can get one tomorrow here. But it's trying to tell you how good those peach milkshakes are unless you, you want to go try one. I was talking to a guy yesterday. He said, well, I've never heard of it. Maybe this morning. He said, I've never heard of that. I said, oh, man, listen. You go try one. Tell me what you think. Well, that's when the Holy, where the Spirit of God is. And so the, God's, God's presence were there. And, and Peter was saying, Lord, 
on the mountaintop with you, it don't get any better than this. The fish fries, the 5,000, and the miracle of those, that was pretty cool. But we didn't want to stay there. But Lord, we've been here. We've, we've witnessed. We've heard. We, we understand now. I understand now. It would be like Peter saying, Lord, man, I understand. Let's just stay here. Look what happens. While he was still talking, verse 5 says, that a bright cloud overshadowed them. Now Moses could relate to being on a mountain and, cloud, and, a, and a cloud overshadowing it. Remember? Well, here he's still talking, and this bright cloud just comes down, and this voice, God's voice, God's voice. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It was the same voice that some had heard several months earlier at his baptism when the Spirit of Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, and there's a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. But here, God continues. And God says, Listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying. Wow. Hear him. Hear him what? Hear him as he's, as he's, now they understand. Now they understand God's plan. It's so different than the plan that they understood that man thought. Now they're understanding more and more just how costly sin is. That this person, this man, this good man, this righteous man, this holy man is the only one. He's the only one from the beginning of creation. He's the only one through all the end of creation. He's the only one that is able to go to the cross and die and his sins pay for the, the sins of the, uh, his blood pay for the sins of the world. It was only in him. There is salvation in no other than Jesus Christ. And he's trying to, and, he, and he's, he's wanting him to understand this. And God says, this is my son, man. He's, I, I, I'm so pleased in you, son, you've done good. Now, guys, listen to what he's telling you. Well, look what happens. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and they were afraid. Hearing God. And Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, guys. It's okay. You don't have to be afraid. Verse 8. I told them this morning, I would, if I would love, and I know there there'd probably got to be somebody. If I, if I was a good preacher, a good preacher could really preach a message on verse 8. Verse 8 says, when they lifted up their eyes. They saw no man save Jesus only. Wow. Now, I understand. I understood what it's saying is when they, when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. They heard God's voice. The cloud's gone. But Jesus is there. And, and all of a sudden, they were, they were fixed. Their eyes were fixed on him because God had said, listen to him. But I think it goes even more significant and a layer or two deeper than just that, especially with me. Because you see today, listen to me, today people, people, good people, can get in the way of us seeing Jesus clearly. I shared with you how when Barbie and I felt God's call on our, our life to go to, to San Francisco, how good friend, good friend, came to us and said, you misread the stars. Yeah. And good people giving us unbiblical counsel or giving us human wisdom when we need God's wisdom. Let alone, I'm not even talking about people that, you know, I, and, I, and I'm not saying, I remember preaching yesterday at the funeral for Miss Joe George, and Joe's philosophy was there was, she had never, there was no such thing as a bad kid. She believed that. Now, she was quick to point out to me, but there were some kids who had, who had not received the proper amount of discipline and training as they should have had on their way up. But they weren't bad. Um, and and, I, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to say, I'm just simply saying that sometimes Satan, Satan can use good people to come between and get in the way of us seeing Jesus clearly. I, again, I'm not, that's not my message, but there is something about lifting up our eyes and seeing him. When we've seen him, Eddie, 
You play the drums. Sometimes, and I've told him, I've, I told him, sometimes I, I just, I, I, he worships. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed the band? They worship. If, it, if it's Linda playing the organ, she's worshiping. You know, Mildred on the piano, the, the, Mike, Joy, Eddie, Bob, uh, David, all of them, Wendell. Uh, Mitch is another one. Pray for his hearing, you know, on the, on the bass. But you ever watch them, and, and they just worship. When we, sometimes music, we can just, we see him. We see him. Oh, my friend, this morning, if you're here as a Christian, pray that like Peter and James and John, that we could just focus and see him. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm convinced if God pulls back the curtain just a little bit, if you can see just a little bit of how much Jesus loves you, you say, he don't know me. Jesus, listen to me. Jesus knows every wart. He knows every sin. He knows every thought. He knows every action we've ever done. And yet he loves you. And he loves me. Now I want to tell you, that is hard to comprehend. But when, but when you receive that, it ain't like anything else. It's, it's, it, you know, it ain't like, there's nothing, it's hard to describe. It's his love. So they look up, they see Jesus only. I've got I've to move quickly. And Jesus, uh, and, and when they do this, and they, 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 then they start off the mountain. And as they're coming down the mountain, Jesus is talking. And, I, and, and Jesus looks over and says, now, now, guys, you can't tell anybody what you've seen and witnessed and heard Till after my resurrection. I can imagine Peter. I can imagine Peter nodding. Peter knew why. Before, he didn't understand it at all. And he had been with Jesus all this time. And Jesus had just got through it. I can imagine Jesus saying, Peter, remember, remember how I kind of had to rebuke you? Yeah, I do. And he, I, Jesus said, if you begin trying to tell people and explain to people what you have seen, what you have heard there on the mountain until after my resurrection, you're going to create more confusion than you do help. But after my resurrection, they'll understand. After my resurrection, they'll understand more easily, more quickly. And those who are really wanting to believe, I will open their eyes and they can. It speaks to me of, of timing. Jesus is so much about timing. Even with his disciples, we read in Scripture that one time he said to them, hey, there's a lot of other things, guys, I'd really like to talk to you about, but I, don't, but I can't do it right now. It's not the time. You're not ready, and it's not the time. Timing. Timing's so important in your life, in my life, and in the life of the gospel. Jesus was saying to these, to these guys, hey, there'll, come, there'll be a time, it'll be the right time, and then I, you need to tell it, man. You need to write it. You need to put it down. Because it's, it's significant and it's important. Now, let me go on. And then his disciples asked him, saying, "Well, what, what is, what is a, why did the scribes say that Elijah had to come first? If, if this, and we understand now. But well, why did they say that Elijah had to come? And Jesus said, uh, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. And I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they didn't know him, but have done to him that which they wanted to, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of men. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. See, some people try to use the Bible, this scripture, and they try to use it to say, well, the Bible teaches reincarnation. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The, the Bible pre preaches regeneration through Christ. <laughs> We can be a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things new. But nowhere in scriptures it talk about that we come back as, an, as another being or another entity. Not at all. Jesus was saying, John the Baptist came in the power and in the spirit of Elijah. He was dressed like a prophet, wearing this, this rough clothing out in the wilderness. People didn't understand him, but he told it like it was. He pulled no punches. And it was that truth and that, that uh, confronting of sin that ultimately would have Herodias' wife, brother's wife uh, no, it's Herodias, right? Her daughter to say, I want the head of, of John the Baptist. And they would kill him. Now, 
Let me wrap this up a little bit differently than I, than I did first service. What, what an impact. You, you know, we, religious speaking, we talk about being a mountaintop experience. Camp. You have those mountain, uh, you know, I know you kind of camp, God, Holy Spirit just works. And oftentimes you'll come, guys, you'll come to uh, the campfire, almost a campfire service. It doesn't have to be that, but, but always there's, there's, there's like expectations. God's going to show up and do something awesome there. And there's campfire services that you just, it's just like, man, you're there. You could, at that point, you, Jeff and Sarah give you squirt guns, you go attack hell. You know, nothing, you're invincible. God's Holy Spirit is powerful. You know, nothing can face you. Let's go. Our God is powerful. Our God can do anything. There's nothing that can stop us. There's those mountaintop experiences. And we, as, as church, sometimes we've, we've had those, you have those services and you walk away, you've seen the power of God and transforming lives and changing homes and changing marriages and changing families and changing communities. It's God at work and you're on the mountaintop with him. Then there's religious, and then the religious talk and Christianese, then we say that then sometimes there are valleys, okay? Valleys. Now, religious, mountaintops experience, that's why I I'll call this the message on the mountaintop of Jesus. Next week is what happens in the valley? <laughs> because look at this. We're, we're not, as this is another day, it says, and when they were come to the, SC, and when they were come to the multitude, they're coming off the mountain. There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, verse 15 of seven, chapter 17, Lord, have mercy on me, for my son is lunatic and sore vexed. Oftentimes he falls on the fire and into the water. Other translations. It says, what does it say? My son is epileptic, he has seizures. And these seizures, sometimes, he's, sometimes he's, they've thrown him into the fire. He's been burned badly. They look at these scars. Sometimes, one time in a seizure, it threw my son in the water, tried to drown him. And he said, Lord, can you do something to help me? And I brought my son to your disciples for them to pray for to help him. And they prayed. And he's worse than he was before. Got to stop right there. What happens with those, when those mountaintop experiences to those valley experiences? Wow. Peter, this is transformation. We change when we see Jesus clearly. Oh, uh, uh, Craig, if I got Second Peter, who's up there? Is that is that uh, Jay? Who is that? Is that Jay? Jake. He's getting married. Y'all get married when? August? Huh? Fourth of August. That is so cool. Man, it's that time of year. Ah, I love it. Barbie and I just talk about it. So precious. All right, Jake. Second Peter. Later, Peter, you, th you think this had an impact on Peter's life? Being with Jesus, seeing what he saw, hearing what he, hear what he heard, witnessing what he saw on the mountain? Look what Peter would say. And, and he was writing to a group of Christians that were being persecuted. And he said, listen, guys, we're not following fallen." We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were, he says, but I was eyewitnesses of his majesty. Where do you think Peter's talking about? Peter said, I remember being on the mountaintop and I saw it and I heard it and I know what I'm telling you. It's true. Look at this. Go on. Oh, man, it's so exciting. He said, for we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What do you think Peter was thinking about? Man, he was, this was an experience that changed his life forever. One more. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Where God is is holy ground. For Moses, it was a burning bush in the desert. For Peter, it was a mountaintop when his eyes were opened and his understanding was revealed. For me, it was a corner of the altar in the old sanctuary on a Saturday night. And I was a barefoot boy. And I'd heard a gospel message about heaven and hell. I knew I didn't want to die and go to hell. And I knew Jesus loved me. And I didn't know. I did not understand it fully at all. 
And I still don't. But I understood enough to know this. If Jesus loved me that much, I wanted to give my life to him. Have you done that? Have you given your heart and life to him? Jesus would tell his disciples just at the end of chapter 16, that's the only way you're going to live. He said, he who gives his life for my sake, loses his life for my sake, is going to live, man. It's not, he says, he who tries to gain his life by his own means is going to end up being disappointed and deceived and let down and led astray. Well, I just keep chewing on this. I keep praying, Lord, there's, what, do you want us to, what do you want us to take away from this, this scripture, from this experience, this mountaintop experience? And he just keeps talking. He just keeps showing to me. It's my prayer that he keeps showing to you what he's wanting you to see out of this scripture to change your lives. Timing. There may be those people that you go to school with or work with. Um, maybe you've, maybe, you know, God's had you in this position. Maybe you've, there's this, this person you've tried to share the gospel with and, uh, and it's just like they're not listening to you. I understand. Maybe I, you know, I never forget a friend of mine. And uh, I, finally he said to me, I don't want you, Jerry, I don't want you, you're welcome to come visit me. But I don't want you coming and preaching to me anymore. And I looked at him and I said, I, I respect that. But it's okay if I pray for you. And he thought just a moment and he said, well, that's all right. And I thought, he has no idea what he's just done. <laughs> <laughs> My words aren't important necessarily. God don't have to have those and need those unless he tells me what to say. But the power of God, when we pray, it, and, and when you pray, you pray for those people that you work with. You pray for those people that, that you see that you're friends with, but you grieve because you know they are lost. And you know they, they're not really, they don't know what living is like you do because they don't know the Lord yet. And you want them to. You pray. And at the right time, in the right way, there'll be an opportunity. Bob Barish says it this morning. Somebody may have to help me. I call him all, I, the man in the Bible study. No, I, I, I can't ever get this right. I even called him uh, Friday night and said, okay, I'm going to preach a funeral tomorrow. I need to know about it. But Bob Ayers says something about you can walk your walk, you can talk your walk, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's, 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 to me it's like tongues that needs interpretation. <laughs> but the interpretation that, that Jerry Hilton gets is our lives speak so much louder oftentimes than what we say. It's what, how we live. So you live your life for Christ. Young people, you live your life for Christ. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. You may not know it. You may not ever realize it here, but you might someday. You older folk, you parents, you grandparents, you great-grandparents, you live. There, is, there are those battles. We understand the spiritual battles. Barbie, this, and I, we appreciate it so much. I, I can say this. Um, it's one of those things. I don't want to spoil it by, by saying it. I just want to tell you. I love my wife, and, and I think I'm closer to her today than I've ever been. Uh, and we appreciate so much. It's been so encouraging. The cards that you've sent for her. You know, we're, she's dealing with this blood pressure thing. She'd never dealt with it before. 13 years ago, Ireland did in Piedmont and had an issue with the heart, but that was taken care of. Never had a blood pressure, but a little over a week ago, this blood pressure issue. Last Sunday night, I had to leave service. <clears throat> and we, when we got to the ER, blood pressure was 225 over 95. Um, yeah, yeah, that's enough to make you say, well, and her, for her normally, so like 100, 130 over 60. I tell her she's cold blooded. You know, she's, her, heart's, her heart just, just like a diesel engine, it just says there, kaboom, kaboom. The blood pressure's not high. <clears throat> but your cards, your prayers have been such an encouragement for us. And this morning, first service, Barbie hadn't even had a chance to tell you this. First service, Bob Jones came up and sat with me on the front pew, and he said, and he, and he talked to me. And he said, I'm dealing with the same thing. We're going through this. You're testing all these tests on your heart. And you make sure, and he said, they, you know, they'll test your kidneys to be sure sometimes the kidneys have a great effect on your blood pressure. 
But he said they, they've done all this. They don't know what's causing it. It's just causing it. And others have shared. And I understand, and Barbie, Barbie and I have talked about this. She says, sometimes there gets to be a spiritual battle in that. So those of you that are dealing with physical, whatever those, and it can be all kinds of ailments. We know we trust God. We know he's sovereign. We know he can do what he wants to do. We know that. But oftentimes then the enemy will come whispering lies. But what about this? What if this happens? What if it's that? And Barbie, Barbie said to me, she said, there, and she said, but I know when there comes, she said, there comes times and I know that it's spiritual. I mean, I'm not denying what's going on physically, but I know that the real battle is to be fought and won spiritually. Know that. God has equipped you with his word and with the Holy Spirit of God for just battles such as those. And, and it, it, it can be that. It can be those of you that are, that are going through all kinds of things that cause fear and depression, loss of a spouse, loss of a family member, all kinds of things. I'm just telling you here this morning, we got a, we got a Savior that knows what you're going through. And he don't send you through it and meet you on the other side. But he goes right through it with you. And the operative word is through it. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I've tried just to, to share what you've shared with me. Now let your Holy Spirit take your word and Lord, apply it to our, our, our minds so that we understand and our hearts so that we believe and in our lives so that we're obedient. Lord, it's possible that there may be several here this morning that's never trusted you as their Lord and Savior. Maybe they just tried to, to be good and thinking that they, eventually they'll be good enough. But for some reason, they've never either understood clearly as they understand right now that believing you and receiving you is by faith. We trust you and ask you to come into our lives. But they understand that right now. If that's you, just simply by faith say, God, come into my life. Make me yours. You came to suffer and to die and to be raised from the dead for the sins of the world. And in doing that, you did that for my sins. And I believe you. And I'm willing to give you my life and say it's not my own anymore. You take it. You take it. Now, if you're not ready to do that, don't do that. Don't say you do and don't. But maybe it's just maybe the Holy Spirit of God is saying to you, this is exactly what you've been waiting on. Right now, by faith, just reach out and take it. He's offering it to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Their heads bowed and their eyes closed. If you ask Christ to come into your heart and life just now, I'm going to embarrass you, but I'm going to give you a chance to acknowledge that. Would you just raise your hand and put it up and put it right back down? See, I prayed that. See the hands? See those hands? Other hands? Most important decision you'll ever make. Father, and now I pray for those of us that have made that decision sometime prior. Sometime for some it's been a long time ago. For some it may have been yesterday or last week. But we've made that. We know we're, we're following you. I ask that you would help us to see you more clearly. walk with you more dearly and serve you more fearfully in the opportunities that you present before us. In Christ's name, amen.